those local issues intimately. I've got a record of volunteering here in the community. I am the candidate that can compete with Scott Peters for every single vote. Yeah, it's a, it's a public event. It's a public library. Thank you, John. We're going to go ahead and move on down to Denise. Good evening. Thank you so much the for having me tonight. I'm a little don't want the video tonight. Okay, um, that's fine. I am right um, because I'm a public event. Yeah, so I'm perfectly within my rights to film. After nearly eight years under President Obama, it has become a very, very clear divide in mentalities about how this country should be run. There's a mentality that's ours, which is that government is best, serves us best when it gets out of the way. And there's a mentality that's on the left that says more government intrusion and the use of your money to fund other people's agendas is the best way to go. And I think that's never been clearer than the difference between all of us here on stage and Scott Peters. Certainly, we are all more alignment than he is. Um, and I think that at this point in time, the thing that my parents came here for in the 60s, when my dad was in the Air Force, my mother was an immigrant, was to ensure that we could live the American dream. And so we really need to fight for those principles and those values, and that's why I'm running in this election. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Hi, uh, Mike Canada. I'm a 28-year resident of Port Ottawa, off and on. I started out here in the U.S. Navy, flew an S3 Viking, uh, went to law school, studied international law, tax law, so I've got a little uh, background on those areas. Also, I was a defense contractor and flew UAS or drones in Afghanistan and Iraq for four years with uh, combat tours of U.S. Marines, United States Navy, and with uh, Special Operations Command. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about our privacy concerned about the education of our children. I'm deeply concerned about Social Security, Obamacare, and where we're heading with this nation. Something has to be done. There are no real solutions out there. I'm not here to offer concrete solutions. What I'd like to do is hopefully we'll give into that tonight and earn your vote. Take off the top years for a Republican back in our district. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. I'm Jackie Atkinson, and I'm running for the 52nd District also. Now, I am a combat veteran, wounded warrior, and a businesswoman. And by the time I was a captain, I served four combat tours in the United States Marine Corps. I was also honored to be one of the first female combat engineers in the Marine Corps. So, I believe strongly in a strong principled foreign policy that keeps us on the offensive against Islamic extremism, we must secure our border, and we absolutely need better care for our veterans. When I left active duty service, I got into a small business, and that small, small business specialized in giving the military the tools and resources necessary to fight our overseas enemies. And that was 10 years ago. And I addressed the threats of improvised explosive devices. And in less than four years, I grew a very small business from $2 million to $75 million. And today, I'm still working on ground in Iraq and Afghanistan. I have real-world experience. I'm a businesswoman and a combat veteran that can represent you. Thank you. Thank you to all five candidates. We're going to go ahead and um, start the next series of questions off uh, with Jackie. I'll sort of leave this one off. Um, before we get going, I would like to uh, just make sure everyone's aware we have a, a friend in the background. I would like I would like all of us to give him a big round of applause and welcome him here. He works for the DCCC. Now, he is not our enemy. He is a, he, I'm sure he's a great guy. We just have different views on the future of our country. Uh, so everyone wave hi in the back to him. Hi, guys. How's it going? Just want the candidates to be aware of that Hello. as well. And uh, we have also, uh, John, we've also gone ahead and um, footage will be okay. Okay. So we're now going to move on to the topic of immigration. I want to start off by asking each candidate to take 60 seconds to give us your position on the current immigration policies in the United States and the role immigration should be playing in our country. Starting with Jack, 60 seconds, please. Outstanding. So the first thing we need to do before we even talk about immigration reform is that we must secure our border. We have to support the men and women that are protecting our borders and trying to keep us safe before we even talk about a pathway to citizenship. So I know we can do that. Technologies are already available. You hear Trump talk about a wall? Well, the wall is just a byproduct. I said not only a wall, 
But we need force multipliers for that wall. We need ISR assets, cameras, underground detectors. This technology is available. So before we talk about that pathway to citizenship, let's talk about securing the border first. And I promise from day one, I'll work towards that for you. Thank you. Same question over to Terry. All right, 60 seconds, here it goes. Uh, I'm a solutions guy, that's all you're gonna hear from me. So I have a thing called the Equality Bill, so just follow me. First step, executive order, federal ID law, photo, with fingerprints. Q, quality of life immediately goes up for all Americans. U, immediately unites all of us as Americans and move on to other problems. A, immediately accounts for everybody that's in this country undocumented. Where are we at? L. All the laws are going to have for so equality. So, law, all the laws that are on the books will have to be certainly enforced. I, everybody that's on document will have one year to go get that photo ID, get their thing, uh, get their fingerprint, get their photo ID, they're registered, they're in. They have one year to do it. They don't comply, they leave. One year. After five years, they can apply for citizenship. And that's basically it. So, done. No wall, not the rest of it. We just account for everybody. Thank you. Um, immigration, I am, uh, I was the paper boy down in the uh, neighborhood that I grew up in in Chula Vista. I used to practice my Spanish uh, talking to the illegal immigrants that were being smuggled through our neighborhood. I've grown up with this. Um, I'm also the husband of a beautiful uh, Chinese woman from Malaysia. I applied for her to come here on a fiancé visa. January 2010, she took the oath of U.S. citizenship. I've been through this hot mess of our immigration system from front to back. And I know that the reason why people are coming here illegally is because we forced them to make a decision between waiting in a line that's not moving and putting food on the table. I say we fix the problem where the problem really lies. The bureaucracy, the immigration bureaucracy, is an absolute dysfunctional mess. Triple for congress.com. I have a very, very specific legislative proposal to fix this problem. Thank you. American citizenship is a privilege, not a right. And that's something that my parents understood when they applied to be citizens. When my mother came here in 1969, she had to bring x-rays of her lungs to show that she was healthy enough to become an American citizen and take advantage of all that we had to offer and contribute to our society. And that's something that I think really needs to change the mindset. And we start that by understanding that America is most, the most compassionate country in the nation, never a truer friend to those in need, but recognizing that we can only be compassionate if we have a strong sense of our borders and our boundaries and our laws. We are a nation as much of compassion as we are of justice. And we must start, as I'm sure most of us up here would agree, by securing our border, because a house divided against itself cannot stand. We need to defund sanctuary cities because we're working to incentivize the wrong things, <coughs> lawlessness. So as soon as we align and agree that we must, in fact, enforce the laws we have on hand, we can get this immigration issue under control. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is a bit of a stickler for me as well. Uh, my wife, my beautiful wife, Caroline, was a uh, is an English citizen, and we had to go through again the hot mess of immigration to get up here. We stood in line after line at the INS trying to get her through. Again, we had the same problem with X-rays to sure that she, it showed that she didn't have a tuberculosis or anything like that. I agree. We need a system that brings the best folks here and helps out in our country. However, on the other side of the coin, I do believe again it's a privilege and not a right. We have to make sure the right people are coming through. We have to look at what we're doing in our in corporations, H-1B visas. People at the Disneyland were getting fired from jobs because supposedly they couldn't find the technology folks to do the job there. And the only reason they did it was to get lower wages. That's it. And the, and, and the, and the humiliating thing that these people had to go through was the fact that they had to train the people that were placing them. We need immigration reform. We need to treat everybody fairly. We need to secure the borders, but we really have to take a look at how that's economically burdens. Thank you. Thank you to all the candidates. We're now going to move into just uh, two or three rapid fire questions. We're looking for the candidates to use their cards and say yes or no. First question, we'd all like you to hold these cards at the same time. We'll go through all three. 
and then we'll go ahead and give you about 30 seconds to add some context to your, your answers. Uh, first question, should the federal government, excuse me, should the federal government reduce funding in cities, commonly referred to as sanctuary cities, that do not enforce immigration laws? Yes or no? All right, so we have a unanimous decision there. Do you support increasing the number of H-1B visas? All right, four one there. Last rapid fire question, would you support a pathway to citizenship for immigrants that entered the country illegally before securing the border? <laughs> support a pathway to citizenship before securing the border. All right, I'm gonna go ahead now, we have, um, we're going to give each candidate 30 seconds uh, to add some context to their questions. And I'm going to um, focus on where the outliers were. Denise, I'd like to give you 30 seconds um, in your response to the number of H-1B visas. Sure. So I work a lot with the startup community. And some of the most uh, innovative companies are lacking in one thing. They say it resoundingly every time I talk to them. And that's the talent that they need, the engineers that they need to get the jobs done and move our economy forward so we can hire more people and have more disruptive technologies that change and improve the way that we live. We should be welcoming those who give the most to our society, who give the most to our economy, who contribute and want to contribute to the growth of our economy. And H1B provide a way to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now let's move down to Terry. Terry, I believe you answered uh, to the question of, would you support a pathway to citizenship for immigrants that enter the country illegally before securing the border? I believe you said yes to that. Would you like to provide us with a 30-second explanation? Sure. Well, as far as, so that's directly in line with the visas. I, as long as you have some an American in the country that doesn't have a job, we don't need any more visas. Now, as far as my proposal goes, it, it all runs in line. The way you set it up with an equality bill to bring those people in is you start allowing people that work in the system to execute allow the Border Patrol, all the federal agencies, everybody that's supposed to do their job, do their job with somebody that's been holding it back. So if you have one year for all of them to get uh, registered and accounted for and all set up, we can accomplish all that in one year. Once that's all done, now we can move forward. So we've been talking about securing the border. As long as I've been alive, it's not been done. So you can't do this and then do this. You need to be done concurrently. Thank you, Terry. We're now going to move on to the because there were five projected take yeah, the second. Add, add yeah. Sure. Um, talk about H one B visas. Now I'm 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 all for that to a certain extent. However, we're pushing more and more people to go to university. We're pushing more and more people to get into debt. And what are we doing? Are we teaching the people the right things in universities, the right technologies, the right things? We have to look at ourselves. We can't keep going outside to take look for people who are being talented enough to come in and do our thing here. It, it, it's a matter of education. We don't have the right people here. We need to find a way to build that education so we don't have to go to the outside and get people to come in and do those jobs. Thanks. Thank you. And I'd also like to give uh, Jackie 30 seconds as well. In regards to the same question of visas or immigration? Of your choice. Your, oh, your my choice. Point. Okay. Well, I think we need to be careful before we allow anybody in. The responsibility of the government, the number one priority is to keep Americans safe. Let me remind you, in San Bernardino, one of the shooters was here on an H1 visa. She was here, and we did not keep Americans safe. There was no due diligence to allow Islamic terrorism across our borders. So that is why I do believe we have to secure the border first, prior to talking about the pathway to citizenship. I do not believe it can be done concurrently. We have to do one, and then we'll do the other. Thank you, Jackie. Now over to John. Yeah, H-1B visas are a, uh, a wonderful opportunity to gain the system on both sides. There are countries out there that have young people and the government gives them make work projects so that they can have something to stick on their resume. It's not real world stuff. And they only do that so that they can, they can qualify in an application for an H-1B visa. They're gaming the system. Um, there is, a, I think it was uh, Toys R Us was gaming the system, having to watch pe having their people train their job replacements. They gain the system. There's, it's, just, it's just an opportunity to gain the game. All right, thank you all, all the candidates. We're now going to move on to our next topic of uh, tax reform and fiscal policy, starting with Mike. Uh, I'd like each can candidate to take 60 seconds to discuss the role of fiscal policy that's currently planned in the United States, or at least your view of fiscal policy in the United States. Well, in my view of fiscal policy, really, it surrounds the tax scheme that we have in the system right now. 
tax dollars obviously drive the government. It's where we get our funding, it's how we put our programs together. However, looking at how we're spending those, those, that money on, on entitlement programs and things that aren't doing our country good is ludicrous. The bigger issue to me, though, is the tax situation. This year, we took in $1.45 trillion in tax revenue. It's a record. Right? And we're still doing it under a broken system. And those revenues have been increasing because of the Affordable Care Act. Right? We're taxing people. We're penalizing people. We're not having health care. That money's going to the coffers. It's not being responsibly spent. We're getting deeper and deeper into debt. If we just had a flat tax system that did 17.5% among 160 million people in this country on an average of 48,000, we could get rid of this tax that we have and go from there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Now over to Jackie. Okay, only 60 seconds to talk about one of my passions. One of the reasons why I'm a Republican is because I am a fiscal conservative. I'll open up with real-world experience. I just sent $17 million back to the taxpayer. I told you my intro, I'm a businesswoman. Well, I'm a DOD contractor that runs a program in support of warfare. And I saved over $17 million in less than four years, and I sent that back to the Treasury. I didn't spend my ceiling because I knew I could streamline and not reduce inequality in my programs. And I gave ratings that are A-plus from the government because of that. And that's why I continue to do business with the Department of Defense. So I have real-world experience in this. I also believe in a flatter tax care. Not necessarily 17.5%, but we need to ensure Americans are paying their fair share. There's too much fraud, waste, and abuse in the government too much redundancy, and from day one, I will ensure the programs, organizations, and agencies without a sunset clause come back to Congress and justify their spending. Every American needs to know that their money is being spent responsibly. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Over to Terry. All right, just to follow up on the immigration thing. My plan's exactly the same. You're gonna go at it, they're gonna go off which is what I would challenge the folks up here. It's basically, what is the definition of a secure board? Tell me that, I'm ready to move on. Okay, so as far as the economy is concerned, almost everybody in the room here is old enough to know this, except for the, the go back to the cake table, which is where we all should be. It's the economy, stupid, period. It's that simple. The success here is productivity. We already touched on it a little bit as far as providing the education so we can train people to do the right jobs that they need to do. It's not that difficult. Imagine if we had 0% interest rates when Reagan was president, or even Clinton. Think about all the success we would be having right now as a country. We have to actually look at the obvious and see that there are people running the government right now that don't want us to succeed. So they're gonna put everything they can in the barriers. If we're under 2% growth consistently, we're not getting it. Thank you. Now over to John. Yeah. Um, as far as fiscal policy is concerned, our economy is broken into three right now. We have the political economy, borrow and spend in Washington. We've got a casino that goes by the name of Wall Street. Those two things right there, the money just circulates between those two. And the real world of wealth creation is left behind. I like to uh, think of wealth creation as the craft beer industry. If you're old enough like me, you remember what the better mousetrap meant. Our parents told us, if you want to be wealthy, brew a better mousetrap. Our kids don't understand that, so I tell them, if you want to be wealthy, brew a better beer. Okay, so it's the same thing. You're taking something that people want, you're making it better. Okay, so right now, our money is not going to the wealth creator. Our money is going to Washington and Wall Street. And because interest rates are so low, they actually can do better gambling on things like commodities and derivatives, rather than lending into a crap brewery. And this is the reason why we're not creating jobs. We need to break that loop so that the money supply prefers the wealth creator, not the rent seekers in Wisconsin, and not politicians making promises they can't keep. Thank you, John. Over to Denise. Under President Obama, our national debt has doubled to $20 trillion. And that's remarkable. I just saw a statistic that said, if Americans, individuals, spent as recklessly as the federal government, they would be racking up $7,000 worth of credit card debt every single year. Now you and I have to, I'm a small business owner, 
you are probably in business or at some point enjoyed being part of the, the economy and contributing, and you also have household budgets. And every one of us as individuals has to be responsible for every dollar that we spend or bring in. For some reason, that principle has escaped not just Democrats, though, but Republicans as well in Washington, D.C. We cannot say that we're not complicit in this effort of increasing our national debt. We have to be very responsible and very firm about sending someone there who knows how to stop that irresponsible spending and will stand against even their own party's leadership to make sure that's done. And that will be me. I'm not going just to make friends. I'm going there to make sure that your dollars are spent wisely. Thank you. We're now going to move ahead to a rapid fire question. We have two of those for you relating to tax reform and fiscal policy. Uh, first question, would you support a flat tax versus the existing progressive tax structure? All right, looking good, guys. Next one, would you support a budget that was not balanced? All right, good. I like that. I like that. Can't trick you there. I'm going to ask you to spend just 30 seconds now. Um, our deficit this year was roughly $500 billion, I believe. In years past, it's exceeded a trillion dollars. It's not going to be. It's not going to be balanced next year. We all know that it's not going to be a balanced budget next year. If uh, one of you five are fortunate enough to get up and represent us as our representative to the 52nd congressional district over in uh, Washington D.C., give us about give us 60 seconds on what your plan to actually balance the budget would be. What types of reduction in spending would we see from you? Uh, put something on the table for us to consider. Starting with Denise. There's so many easy targets in Washington, right? Where do we even begin? There's low-hanging fruit of discretionary spending, which is just a fraction of our actual spending, but is very sensationalist in the case. So we would start there. But then we would move on to look at the most wasteful and burdensome agencies that exist that hamper our ability to create wealth. That starts at the EPA. That starts with the regulations that come at us every single day that make no sense. And then I would go into the IRS, which has a budget of $12 billion a year and hires more people than the CIA and FBI combined. Then I would get rid of the Export-Import Bank, which is basically growing capitalism. That's just the beginning, but that's a good start. Thanks, Denise. Over to Mike. I would have to agree with Denise on this as well. The IRS is the biggest kerfuffle, I guess, in Washington, D.C. The problem that we have with the IRS, not only is it not only is it too big for itself, it allows policies for certain areas to move tax away. It pushes tax revenue away from our shores, i.e. the public letter agreements that you can get through Section 42. We need, to, we need to wrap those up. We need to be able to kind of pull those back in so we put more money back here when we need for ourselves. Thanks. I agree. There is absolutely a tendency of corruption in the IRS, so that must be addressed from day one, and I'll absolutely do that. But I've also discussed the redundancy in those programs, agencies and organizations without a sunset clause. We have to address those, have them come and justify funding for Congress and what their continued, what their continued existence is and how it benefits taxpayers. So I've been in politics now for about 30 minutes. And I'm realizing politics is the same, or debates are very much the same as politics, <coughs> where much is said and nothing is done. So I would like you to think about the government not operating like our homes. We all know this is the most corrupt government in the history of our country. Period, hands down, that's it. So we have to think about it just the way we do our home, which would be freeze spending. You put top line items of the things that we care about in our family, health care, education, those top lines they get paid for. The rest is a 1% reduction on across the board until it's balanced. Simple. Thank you, Terry. Over to John. I believe uh, HHS, the Department of Health and Human Services, is the second largest uh, bureaucracy, uh, second only to the DOD in the government. Um, we can take Medicare, which is a benefit from the Treasury, and put Medicare under the Treasury. We can take the Centers for Disease Control and put it under either the DOD or Homeland Security. We have a local, in just about every single one of our cities, we have a local Department of Health. We have a county Department of Health. We have a state Department of Health. Someone needs to explain why we need four bureaucracies to provide health and human services. And close it down, close down that department and route that money to local governments. Thank you, John. I'd like to pass the mic now over to Mike. Um, Let's talk about entitlement spending. 
Last year, the federal government spent nearly $1 trillion on Social Security. Question to Mike, to lead us off, what reforms, if any, would you make to Social Security? That's a tough question. We have a baby boomer generation coming up that we promise Social Security and, Medica and Medi uh, Medicare too. I've heard some, I've heard some talk of, of getting rid of those altogether, finding a way to cut those spendings. I don't believe we can do that. We made a promise to those folks. We need to honor that promise. However, we need to bring up a, pro a program that sets a line saying, okay, from this point on, we've got your Social Security and Medicare, uh, Medicare, uh, Medicare taken care of. We need to start reforming a program, put money, more money back in the pockets of those young enough to still save to get to the point where they can substitute Social Security. Social Security has been a bugaboo in this whole system because it's always been an account that we can go in and we can take money out of. It's ridiculous. I don't know why we. I don't know why we've never ever put a cap on it, or we've never even said you can't take it from there. As long as it's it's anybody's game to go pull money out of it, it it's not going to work. But we have to make and keep that promise to our elderly and the people coming up on it. To have it there for them and pay into it. Thank you. Over to Jackie. Okay, we're here to talk about entitlement. Has anybody ever heard, so we, we hear that Social Security and it's running out of money. Have you ever heard that welfare is running out of money? Anybody in here? Or running out of money in welfare? Right? Nobody has. So it's not a matter that we have to take away from the entitlements. It's a matter of a spending problem. We don't have the cash flow problem. We have the spending problem. So just like we've been talking about for the last 10 minutes now is that we have to reduce the redundancy and cut back in government fraud, waste, and abuse so that we can ensure the people that have been paid into Social Security are paid back. Thank you. Over to Terry. All right, entitlements. So this goes in line with what I just talked about balancing the budget. That's how this gets executed. The bill is called the Barbell Bill, and if you can just visualize. In the middle, you're doing a heavy lifting. Students already can fall under, under Obamacare. They can go and stay on their kids' plan. We already have Medicare once you Social Security. So this plan would provide free education and health care from conception to age 25. If you're 26 to 66, you're buying your own policy, you're not having to pay for your kids, and you're not having to pay for your parents. So what happens is you go to 25, you work, You've been prepared because you've had a free education, you're healthy, you work through that, you get your own thing on the system, you can't be denied because of pre-existing conditions, etc. There are no caps. And then when you come back, then when you qualify for Social Security, you're right back on the program and off you go. So in the middle, they do the heavy lifting to pay for it. We do the across-the-board freeze and the 1% cuts every year until it's balanced. Thank you, John. Yeah, this is a really tough one for 60 seconds, so let me start with this. www.johnforcefourcongress.com. I have a, a entry under the issues about entitlement reform. You've got Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Okay, I'm going to talk about Medicaid. It's the worst use of taxpayer dollars because we're spending thousands of dollars in emergency rooms uh, treating conditions that we could have treated uh, in a doctor's office. Okay, so you can't talk about this without talking about health care reform. I want to roll all of these exchanges that are failing, I want to roll them up under six regional exchanges that will operate under a federal charter. They will be like your credit union. They will be member owned, they will not be government run. You will open an account, and when you open an account with your, with your credit union style healthcare exchange, you'll take that uh, information to your employer, and your employer will be able to add money directly to your account, and you can have money withheld and put into that account. Extra money can be used for unreimbursed expenses like flexible spending. And then we can take Medicaid money and use it for premium support. Thank you, John. We're going to let Denise wrap this up. I've spoken to a lot of seniors who would really take issue with the notion that Social Security is an entitlement. I know that some people feel like it would be, but in fact, Social Security is something that we all paid into and something that they banked on its promise. And so our promise has to be maintained. They will protect and preserve Social Security. All of us know people who survive month to month, day to day, based on what their promise was made to them. And so there are those as well that you know that are receiving Social Security benefits that probably don't need them. There's plenty of them that probably live here, or maybe in La Jolla or in other affluent places. And there's been a Republican plan floated that I agree with, which would say, if you don't actually need those Social Security benefits, then we should talk about whether you should be receiving them because it's bankrupting the system for those who truly need it. 
We cannot afford to mess with Social Security and take away the promise of those who are dependent on this very fundamental promise that we made them long ago. And so I would just make exception and put a little bookmark there to say when we think about entitlements, let's not put Social Security in that bucket. Thank you. I'm going to ask just a, a quick rapid fire question on that topic. Should people have the right, should people have the option to opt out of Social Security? Yes or no? Thank you. Just, just curious on that one. I'm going to, uh, let's go ahead and start with Jackie. And same question, but let's talk about reforms to Medicare. Reforms to Medicare. So obviously, healthcare is costing a great amount of money, but I do not believe in Obamacare certainly when it comes to our healthcare system. I would like to say I could support the fact that it could be repealed. However, I don't want to leave hundreds of thousands of American citizens without coverage. So I would support reform of healthcare into our country, and that will be one of the things that we need to address when I get into office. Um, it is absolutely our responsibility and individual responsibility of ourselves to take care of ourselves, but we are in a place in society, and I'm a realist, that we do need to take care of our generations. So all of the money that's been placed in entitlements and that you've been spending towards that, we need to ensure that there's proper coverage for American citizens. But Obamacare is absolutely not the answer. Thank you. Terry. So I know you're still stewing a little bit over my barbell plan. It'll take you a little bit to take that in. But again, it's simple. So if you implement that plan, you basically take a look out over the horizon how long we're living. It's our average lifespan right now is 79 years. And we're and we're just going to continue to multiply this with advances in technology and biotechnology, new medications, etc. We have to do the plan now, so we're going to end up where we gotta be, which is going to be taken care of all of us by the time we get to that point. So we're already upside down on Medicare. It needs to be changed, it needs to be fixed. And that's where we're at on this. Uh, Speaker Paul Ryan uh, came out with a plan a few years back, and it was uh, thoroughly um, uh, criticized on complete false pretenses. If you have Medicare Advantage, Medicare Advantage is a, uh, a situation where your policy premium with a private carrier is supported by Medicare. And in many cases, it, it, it takes care of the donut hole. You don't have to worry about uh, that 20% that's not covered. I would take Medicare Advantage and basically nationalize that thing, uh, nationalize it across the board. Uh, another term before that is premium support. Paul Ryan's plan a few years back uh, would have taken the second uh, cheapest um, plan out there, and that would have been the premium support amount you would receive from Medicare. And if you want to go to the less expensive one, then you know there's a little extra money there. If you want to go to a more expensive one, you can add a little money to that. But a premium support Medicare Advantage like program for Medicare is the way to save the program for future generations. Thank you, Denise. Medicare is uh, a, a promise similar to Social Security, which a lot of seniors depend on for life and death purposes. And one of the things that's currently missing from Medicare is any sort of guarantee against catastrophic illnesses and diseases. So. That needs to become part of our solution as we move forward in the reform of Medicare. We also need to think about ways to preserve and protect it by ensuring that states and localities have more control over the money that's being spent in Medicare. Whenever we get farther away from the individuals that we're serving, we get more and more bureaucratic, more wasteful, and less in touch with those the needs of those we're trying to serve with these funds. This is too important of an issue to leave in the hands of Washington bureaucrats and I would advocate making sure that we have a more responsive state or local solution, that we use the monies from Washington to address at the local level. Thank you. I would have to agree with Denise on that, as a matter of fact. Um, I believe that these, these programs work better when you have a more local solution and more local oversight. Putting the federal government in charge of stuff like this really, really doesn't, doesn't pay. We see what happens every time they get a hold of this. It keeps awry. Money doesn't get where it needs to get. People are scared. People worry about the next illness. Who shouldn't have to live like this? It's the same situation we have under Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. The premiums now are so expensive, it's like paying a mortgage. I've spoken to people who are paying $1,200, $1,500 for the same care that they got per month 
that you used to pay three or four hundred dollars for. And that's going to trickle up to Medicare. It's going to trickle up to everything. It's it's a tax bill. That's all it was. Chief Justice Roberts came out and affirmed that. It's kind of a questionable, questionable uh, decision. However, that's what it is. Medical care, Obamacare, is nothing more than a tax issue now. It's a way for governments to get more money. It's a way for our government to get more money. The whole thing is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you also to all five of the candidates. We're now going to move on to the topic of civil liberties. And we're we're not going to start with opening remarks. We're going to get right into specific questions. So using your yes or no cards, first question, should the federal government decide the definition of marriage between two people? One more time, should the federal government decide the definition of marriage between two people? Okay. Next question, do you support allowing states to decriminalize drugs such as marijuana? Do you support allowing states, so not the federal government, do you support allowing states to decriminalize drugs such as marijuana? All right. Last question. Do you support the use of school vouchers in our public education system? All right, so unanimous decision on that last one. Um, I want to. I would like each candidate to provide some context on their answers to these. Some of us, some of you, might have different reasons for being a yes or no uh, on this question. So uh, let's start 30 seconds, and I believe we'll start with John. Any particular question? My choice. Your choice. Whatever you like to provide additional context to. And marijuana. Um, I support the states making it um, available for medical use. Uh, I would like to see the uh, federal government uh, schedule to schedule two and schedule one, the, uh, two, from schedule one to schedule two, because this will make it available for doctors to be able to prescribe. I think there are 20, 21, 22 veterans who are committing suicide every day. And there are some veterans out there that are making medically supervised use of marijuana to cope with PTSD and other injuries. They have gotten off of all of the bad drugs, and the suicide rate is zero. It's compelling. Thank you, John. We're actually going to move it down to Denise. We'll keep this line going. Any of the three? So, I uh, I believe that marriage is in fact defined um, just throughout history and throughout our culture as between being a, between a man and a woman. And so that's what I believe in, and that's why I believe that that has always been the case, and that that shouldn't change or be redefined by anybody. Thank you. Mike. Uh, two issues here. I'm not the federal government defining marriage per se because it's a state's issue. It, it, it's a situation where we have state rights, and why would we even have a state marriage license to go by if it wasn't a state's issue? Okay? It's not something that the federal government, I think, should legislate on. On medical marijuana, I'm not against medical marijuana, but I am against the use of recreational marijuana. I'm just not for it. I see what's happened in Colorado. It's not, it's not a good thing. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm a true Republican, and I believe that government needs to stay out of your home. Absolutely 100%. I believe in state rights, but the government does not have a right to tell you who you should love. Who you should marry, it's not up to them. And it's certainly not up to them to impose their will on the people. And as your representative, it's absolutely my job to represent the will of the district, and that is what I promise to do when I become your representative. Thank you. Well, I told you I spent half my career here in Coronado, the other half I spent in the Middle East. And part of the programs that I've run also, uh, the U.S. military also, as I was uh, selected by President Bush, one, to rebuild baseball and all the services. I did that worldwide, built 50 teams. Over that time, I had 30,000 players, staffs, coaches, wounded warriors that we developed to move on to go into pro sports and do other things they wanted to do in business. You can imagine over all, all of these years, 25 years, I have a lot of these people that came through my program now that are suffering quite a bit with cancer and other things. So I have seen medical marijuana do positive things. But I don't like what I'm seeing in other states when you just you give the kids a, a bad impression to legalize it that way. So I'm, I'm against that part. Thank you, Terry. That's all five of you. All right, we're going to go ahead and leave the mic with Terry. We're now going to move on to the subject of national defense 
terrorism. Terry, please take 60 seconds to tell us your vision for the role of the United States military in defending our nation and the current threats we face. All right, I have a 16 year old daughter. I have two sons serving on active duty in the Navy right now. My daughter has not been alive for one day of peace in this country, period. I told you I did seven combat tours overseas. I have seen ISIS eye to eye. I've been shot at, I've been in helicopter crashes, and I'm telling you, these people pick on women and children because they're cowards. So this low state of war, all it does is help defense companies and help the government stay in business. That's all it does. So if we're really serious about ending it, we set a time, a day, and we do it. It's just that simple. Or we can just rudder this thing along for 50 years. Absolutely. Uh, next is John. Yeah. Okay. John, I'm going to go ahead and repeat that question one yeah. more time, though. Please take 60 seconds to tell us your vision for the role of the United States military in defending our nation and the current threats we face. Okay, there are three uh, authorities that belong to Congress and Congress alone in the Constitution. The first one we're all familiar with, the authority to declare war. So the other two that we don't talk much about, the authority to issue letters of mark and reprisal, and to make rules concerning captures on land and sea. The very first thing we need to do is Congress needs to issue a letter of mark and reprisal against ISIS and Al-Qaeda, and I would include Hezbollah and Hamas in that list, and basically open the door for special operations and even for um, uh, paramilitary operations against those groups. There's another part that we can do in legislation called a classified annex, and this is something that's done in secret. I think we have, have to have a classified annex to the letter and that we need to name names, and in particular, name the names of the people that are moving the money. When the people that are moving the money for ISIS get knocked on by SEAL Team 6 one night, guess what's going to dry up? The money will dry up very quickly. It, and then it's that third rule of uh, concerning captures on land and sea. That puts Gitmo out of the president's jurisdiction entirely. We'll keep it open. Thank you, John. Over to Denise. I believe America is the greatest force for good and peace and stability in the world. And when we have a strong military, we have peace in places that might otherwise be very unstable. But power abhors a vacuum. And when America is not her strongest, when we are not certain, when we let people like Assad cross red lines that we've drawn very clearly in the sand, we open the door to other bad actors to step into their regional spheres of influence and exert power that is bad for humankind. These are people who are not do not share our values and cannot be trusted with the power that they take. And so we must increase our federal funding to the military. We must increase it so that we can again be a powerful force for good. We have been decreased under President Obama. Our military budget has been reduced to, to World War II levels, post-World War II levels, and that is unacceptable. We must be able to operate decisively, and we go in and we define our objectives. We must be able to win. I do agree we need to increase our uh, defense spending as well. However, we need to stop, we need to stop this force reduction. I mean, we're, we're reducing our ships, we're retiring planes and equipment that we should be retiring. And we're also dealing with an ROE that is just unacceptable. Having spent four combat tours over in Afghanistan and Iraq, we have gone to the door, we've knocked on the door of these terrorists, and we haven't been allowed to follow through. We have missed so many opportunities in asymmetrical warfare, it's ridiculous. We need to get leadership and a policy going to where we target something, we follow through, and we take care of it. All of this sounds good, but in 2003, when I crossed that line of departure into Iraq as a very young lieutenant, we crossed that line of departure without the proper tools and resources. And that is the last thing I'm going to do is send our and America's sons and daughters in harm's way without armor, without the tools and resources that they need. Because I did, I served and I lost friends. I did several combat tours, just like some of the people that are sitting up here today. I take it very serious when it comes to that. But you know what the problem is today? The root problem is that we are faced with a very dangerous movement. The first time in the United States history we're faced not only from a threat from country, but a movement. And that movement is Islamic extremism. 
It's not just ISIS or Boko Haram or Al Qaeda because we're if we defeat ISIS, we're going to leave a vacuum open for the next horror to come through whatever country. So we are now faced with this, and if we do not end the root cause of this problem, then we'll continue to fight it. And I just got back from Iraq just a month ago, and I saw children there that were babies when 9/11 occurred. It's disgusting that 13 years later we're still fighting this because of people like Barack Obama and his administration. When I get into office, I promise to address this, and I will never send people overseas without the tools and resources necessary. Thank you, Jackie. Over to Terry. So I'm sorry. Is that all five? All right. We can all talk. All right. Sorry. I can't count to five. Apparently. Unless you want to hear the solution. It's been it's been a long day. It's been a long day. All oh, right. Let's move along to uh, next question. This one we're actually going to start with Jackie. Uh, Coronado's home to many veterans. Give us your current assessment of veteran affairs and what, if any, reforms you would support to provide care for our veterans. It's an extremely sad state that we're in today. And, it, and I think it was Terry that touched upon it. 22 veterans commit suicide every single day. 22 veterans. Think about that. In San Diego, we have an enormous issue because we lost 27 veterans between 2014 and 2015 that were age 45 and below. Take that in. Those are my brothers and sisters that I served with. This is something that I have addressed and I've seen personally, not only overseas, but here. I've held the hands of people that have suffered from this and survived suicide attempts. This is a very serious issue. A lot of you also don't know that San Diego also has the highest amount, the highest population of post 9-11 veterans in the entire nation. If we don't address this problem now, we will be addressing it 10 years from now. So I believe that reform for the VA, and if you are on a waiting list for more than 20 days, you deserve the health care. You need to go anywhere in order to get that health care. Any doctor and the government will pay for it. So I, one of the things I'm running on is VA reform, and I take it very seriously. Thank, Thank you, Jackie. Over to Terry. Again, your solution. You're going to have the VA, you have the active military. We all have facilities and people that need care. You combine all of them, you put them under the umbrella of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, it goes into the Pentagon under the Joint Chiefs of Command and the Secretary of Chiefs. They handle it. Once the military takes control of caring for the military, we know we'll be taken care of. So that's an easy fix. Now the next part of this is immediately anyone, any VA, any veteran, that needs any assistance whatsoever anywhere on the planet today should be able to walk into any medical facility anywhere, anytime. That's the fix. Believe it or not, I think that we can uh, go a very long way to fix this with a bill that would probably be maybe one or two pages. If I go to Congress, I want to write a bill, and we're going to revert every single employee in the Department of Veterans Affairs to probationary status for one year. When you join federal service as a federal employee, you go on probation for a year. You're effectively an at-will employee, which means you can be fired at will. We need to move all the employees back to that, sta uh, that status so that the higher-ups can actually get rid of the people that need to be getting rid of. Now, we have a pretty good system here from what I've heard, I'm hearing from the friends and people that I volunteer with in, uh, in my community of Mira Mesa that are veterans. And the studies have shown that if you have a veterans administration paired with a university that has a medical school like UCSD, the outcomes are usually good, but the vast majority of veterans don't have access to that. Revert every single employee to probationary status. Get rid of the ones that we need to get rid of, and the VA will begin to work again. Thank you, John. Over to Denise. Yeah, I agree with John. I mean, this is one of those issues where the veterans of our nation, my parents, my father was a veteran, 20 years in the Air Force, they are the most precious and most worthy of our money, finances, support, everything it takes to make sure that they are taken care of for laying their life down on the line for us. And that is a non-negotiable. But unfortunately, that corruption within the VA system starts at the top. Secretary McDonald just recently said that waiting times were down to five, three, four days on which kind of an issue you had that you reported to the VA, but in fact, it was discovered that the IG was not telling the truth, and therefore the secretary did not speak the truth, and those days were actually 22 to 71 days. That's 
absolutely unacceptable. And so we must have a way out for our veterans. We must be able to give them an opportunity to escape this broken system that starts systemically from top to bottom. There's no way out. We must get them the health care the care they need, no matter where it's from. And we must be willing to pay that for the very, it's the very least we can do for people, put their life on the line for us all the time. Thank you, Denise. Mike. I could talk all night on this. <laughs> I've been up against the VA numerous times just for myself. I'm the only, I think I'm the only person that's ever gone through book rehab that's actually gone to law school for that program for the VA, and I had to fight for that for two years. Something that I was entitled to, and that was up to the part. This minute, I went to an open house, a town hall meeting a few months ago, and I think it was November of 2014. There were people there who were desperate to get help, not only medically, but, but for the programs they deserve. The problem is there was nobody eloquent enough there to really say anything. And, 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 and nobody really wanted to listen. I got up and I said, look, this is what we need. And immediately, I had the press guy from the VA come down and say, hey, we need to talk to you about this. I can get their air. I've fought these guys before. I know what we need to do. And, and, and as everybody on this panel can agree, you know, if, a lot of us put our lives on the line for these benefits. A lot of people who are homeless need these benefits. A lot of people need these medical, medical care benefits. We need to shore it up. We need to take this seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for your service as well. We're going to go ahead. This is our last question of the night before we move into closing remarks. We're going to start with Mike. Actually, before we do that, one quick rapid fire question. Would you vote to repeal Obamacare? <laughs> All right, fair enough. Starting with starting with Mike, what would you replace it with, if anything? Well, that's a tough question. 60 seconds, I'm sorry. No, that's fine, that's fine. I only have 60 seconds, good Lord. Uh, it, it, I'm not sure what we can replace it with yet, to be honest with you. I'm not gonna get up here and say we need this program or this program to make it work. What I do need, or what I do feel we need, is we need to maybe move back to status quo before to at least get the premiums down and to get rid of this ridiculous penalty that you have to pay if you don't have medical care. That's asinine. I'm sorry to use that word, but it is. You have to pay $2,000 for not having health care. And as I mentioned before, I have to get to the point where I have to pay a mortgage almost to have health care. That's substandard. I've read these gold, bronze, and silver programs. I, I, I just don't understand it. And as somebody who is a husband, and I have three kids, I really have to sweat this out. And there are situations where people are taking jobs that are paying low wages because they need that health care. It's a choice of, of, of doing better in life or just getting the basic health care that you need. I'm not sure what to, suppl to supply it with yet, but I guarantee you, when I get to office, I will get a prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie. I've already touched upon this, so absolutely I would vote to repeal Obamacare. However, I would not do so if it irresponsibly left millions of people without health care. So I believe that the answer is the reform of health care, the reform of Obamacare. So when I get in office, we will work towards that reform to ensure that we lower costs and that all Americans can afford it. Any questions on my bar bill, Bill? Come on, sir. Does everybody understand it then? You see how you're covered? People in the middle are lifting, the kids are covered, the elders are covered. No free lunch. People in the middle have to do their thing. And then we take care of the people that we take care of. Do I get the extra time? <laughs> no. Um, Obamacare, uh, well, here's what Obamacare has done. Obamacare is uh, very quickly transforming our economy into a part-time worker economy, and that's what companies are doing to avoid the costs. And so now you have people working two part-time jobs, and they can't get a group policy from either. So this goes back to what I talked about, about the credit union. When we came out of the Great Depression, we had a banking problem. And so what we did, we took the idea of a credit union, we created a federal charter, and we allowed civil society to organize banking cooperatives, which would be credit unions. I'm going to take the same basic idea, create a federal charter, allow have six regional health care exchanges, and these are going to be nonprofits. And once you open an account, you hand that information to your employer, the employers will have a mandate, and, and the mandate will be tiered at 10, 20, 30, and 40 hours. So the 20 hour a week employee is going to get half of what the 40 hour a week employee gets. 
So if an employee has two part-time jobs, they're now in the same place to get a, po a policy through that exchange. Thank you, John. We'll have Denise close us out on this. Obamacare is a fraud on the taxpayer. And in fact, it's a bad deal for even those immediately who are experiencing the negative effects on it. Younger people who are on Obamacare are paying 44% higher premiums. That's not a deal. That's certainly not something that we should be supporting. It's also Obama's interfering with the precious doctor-patient relationships that are so important to our specialized, personalized health care. And they're interfering with our moral and religious conscience with respect to many, many different issues. And so we must repeal it. But if Republicans do not have a plan in place to immediately replace it, we will suffer exactly the consequence that we did with the incoming of Obamacare, which is that instead of proposing free market proposals that would have made it more competitive to get a lower cost to get health care for those who were not covered, we let the Democrats take the lead and propose their decisions, their ideas. And we were seen as those who were uncaring about those who could not afford health care. So the onus is upon us to propose realistic solutions that are free market based, that are affordable, that will actually work instead of letting Democrats take up that cause. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. And we're now going to move into the closing statements from the candidates. I'd like each candidate to take, say, 75 seconds. Tell us why you are the best person to defeat Scott Peters and represent us in the 52nd Congressional District. You can speak to the strength of your own campaigns or exactly why you fit the district. 75 seconds to give us your pitch, Denise. Closing arguments are my favorite. I'm a recovering attorney, so this, there we go. Uh, so this, is, this district is a Republican district. We have always been a Republican district. We have a 1.5% Republican registration advantage, and I am the only candidate endorsed by the NRCC, the National Republican Congressional Committee, as a young gun in this race. That is critical because we are running against the most, the fourth wealthiest member of Congress, Scott Peters, who has the full support of the Democratic Party in trying to take this seat again from underneath us. Now, I have raised, I just put out a press release yesterday, I have raised five times more than all of my Republican candidates up here combined. They are all incredible candidates, and I'm proud to be next to them up here. But the reality is, if we want to win this race, we must not only have a message that resonates with people, we must also have a message that we can amplify. If everyone, if nobody knows what we stand for, we cannot win. So we must have the resources necessary to proliferate our message, which is freedom, which is true hope, which is the free market, which is not government in your lives in imposing their, their solutions and taking your money to do that. And so if we're going to win, we must absolutely stand by principle. And I think one thing that everyone in this presidential race and all of these races across the country is really, really are looking for is a candidate who stands by their principles. You are hiring somebody for a job, and that's to represent you, not special interests in Washington. And I will be that candidate. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Mike. Well, I tell you what, this is my uh, introduction to the debates. It's very interesting. <laughs> Why me? I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a taxpayer, I'm somebody who served my country. Maybe, you know, in a sense, maybe a little bit more than some, less than others. But I'm worried about the government being involved in every aspect of our lives. I, I just don't like the idea of, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people, well, I have to tell you, I, I, I used to be described as, you know, ask for, ask for forgiveness instead of uh, begging permission. But, but I, I don't like this idea of this overreaching government, health care, common core in school. I mean, we've got private industry putting together educational programs and taking away the talents in our classroom from actually being able to teach things. We're teaching children to teach them the test. And that trickles down to education and H-1B visas. If we're not doing the right things in schools, or right, not teaching the right things in classes, of course we're going to have to go outside and get somebody else. When it comes to Islamic terrorism, ISIS national defense, I work with SOCOM, Special Operations Joint Task Force. I know where they are. I know how they act, and I know we're not funding it correctly. And we're not taking it, we're still not taking intelligence seriously. Thank you very much. Thank you. So like I said, I'm a combat doctor and a wounded warrior and a businesswoman. 
I'm a woman that's run a company, quite successful. And I'm going to tell you the numbers. I'm going to tell you about a poll that was just done. And that polled the three top Republican candidates in this race. And you know what that poll told us? That I am the only Republican candidate that can beat Scott Peters. Only Republican. That is your key takeaway tonight. If you want to take this seat back, I'm the only Republican that can beat him. And I cannot wait to stand on that stage with him. Scott Peters is afraid of me. Scott Peters is upset, and I'll tell this to DCCC, because he told me 10 years ago I should have been in city council next to him. Well, you know where I was 10 years ago? I was in a fighting hole defending this nation. I'm the only one who has the real world experience, not only in business, but taking on ISIS, even today, just as I did in 2003, crossing that line of departure as a young lieutenant. I served our nation. I support the taxpayer today as a businesswoman. I support the fight on Islamic terrorism, and I'm the one to take back this seat. But I can't do this alone. So please, I need each and every one of your help. Go to JackieAtkinson.com. Give me a call. Post a coffee. I'll come and sit down with you or any of your neighbors, and I would love to earn your support. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you, Jackie. Terry, thank you all very much for coming. This is, you know, now come up on an hour in politics, which is great. I will tell you, since you most of you probably have never done this either, it sounds the same there as it does here. Lots of talking, not a lot of solutions, so that's kind of where we're at. I got into this race because I want to run on Reagan values and common sense. And we can talk about money, we can talk about career politicians, and we can talk about lawyers. And when you do that, take a look at our country right now. That's why we are where we are. So the only way to change that is to go for citizen politicians. I'll probably raise the least. And I'm really not looking to raise a lot. Because that's not what it's all about. If it was, Jeb Bush would still be in the race. And Hillary wouldn't be losing to an open communist. Now would it, would she? So really take a look at how this goes. Because all of us want to go out and do our things to take care of our families mm -hmm. and get on with our lives. And if you don't put the right person in there, we're not going to be able to do that. We're going to have to come right back again and go through this whole drill again. So be very cognizant of your vote. And don't waste any time trying to convince anybody else that disagrees with you. Spend all of your time dealing with like-minded people and getting them to vote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry. John? Yes, thank you as well for coming tonight. Uh, last year, Scott Peters authored a bill. In this bill, Scott Peters is suggesting that we calculate our national debt only by the debt, quote, held by the public. 15% of our national debt is held by the Social Security Trust Fund. That debt doesn't count in Scott Peters' bill. I'm the only candidate up here who understands the ins and the outs of how our debt is affecting our fiscal policy, understanding the ins and the outs of how the bond market works, and why Scott Peters' proposal is so shockingly ignorant and dangerous, and actually dangerous to the value of the Social Security Trust Fund. I'm the only candidate up here that understands how Washington and Wall Street have this little money laundering game going on. I'm the only candidate up here that can and will go to Washington, D.C. and, forgive me for the term, but call BS on Wall Street. Somebody has to go and call BS on Wall Street whether the party likes it or not. But that means that you're going to have to send somebody who will call BS on borrow and spend politicians. I'm that candidate. I'm the only candidate that has a record of accomplishment in our local communities who understands what our local leaders need from their congressional representation so they can solve problems here. Thank you, John. At this time, I'd like to ask the audience to give the candidates a round of applause. As I mentioned earlier, it is not easy to be the person in the arena, so thank you guys all for participating tonight. We have uh, a few minutes um, before the candidates probably need to take off and get to their next event. I'd like to invite invite you to come up, uh, introduce yourself to the candidates, and if there's a candidate you, you like, please get involved in their campaign. And not just get involved in the Republican uh, campaign through June, stay with the party all the way through November, get involved and support the eventual nominee. Thank you for coming out tonight. I'd like to make one more, just uh, one more introduction. Cheryl Rosie, Cheryl, would you raise your hand? Cheryl, if you're interested in supporting the Ted Cruz campaign,
Virginia Payne Cheryl is the chair here in Coronado. Please go see her. San Diego County Co-Chair, please see me if you're interested. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. And if you want to participate uh, in this club going forward, please sign up. Uh, please add your name and email to uh, the list in the back. Thank you all. Thank you.